your lowest quartile is only responsible, only accounts for less than 10% of consumption in the United States. But once you get up to this area that are going to have appreciably large student loan payments, they account for 40% of spending. So there's a storm brewing as we approach October the 1st. What's been propping up the economy and risk assets and what's next for monetary policy, inflation, and the economy overall? We're here to examine these themes with Danielle DiMartino. She is the CEO of QI Research. Welcome back, Danielle. Good to see you as always. Good to see you again, David. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. I want to start with uh, bank failures. There's been a total of four big ones uh, since the beginning of the year. The latest one that closed last week on the 28th of July was Heartland Tri-State Bank. Uh, its assets and deposits will be bought out by Dream First Bank. Uh, about $130 million of deposits in total. Unlike First Republic Bank, which we talked about in May, the market seems to have shrugged off Heartland. Is this either just a case of it not being big enough or are markets just accustomed to the fact that more banks are going to fail? What do you think is happening? So I think I think markets are definitely prepared for these smaller community banks uh, to fail as we press forward just with, just with the, the, the usual recessionary impulses that would tend to take banks down. And of course, as you said, $130 million is is a rounding error co- compared to what we saw last week with, with the forced merger of PacWest and Bank of San Francisco. So that's a whole different level of bank failure that we saw last week. And I think it's much more pertinent to discuss the market shrugging that one off, even though you know after First Republic, it was PacWest that was lined up to be the next domino that fell. Hats off to regulators for making it appear as if PacWest was the acquiring entity. Some very clever accounting and PR done there. But I think that what we should maintain our focus on, especially as regulators are trying to destigmatize the discount window and restress how important it is uh, that banks extend and pretend on commercial real estate loans. And this is coming from regulators from all angles, that there are more banking situations out uh, that, that are lurking out there that we should be cognizant of. But again, David, nothing, nothing matters to these markets. Nothing matters except, I guess, sentiment, and we'll get to that. Uh, but overall, I think the bigger picture is that bank credit has been shrinking dramatically. It doesn't usually happen, but it's a negative growth territory. Who is going to be most affected by a shrinking of liquidity in the system? So, you know, you know a few days ago, we saw uh, a, a plant that, that, that um that employed 510 employees that that supplied jeep that just went belly up you know the plant had been around for for multiple generations i think it's the it's the small business closures that keep coming like a drumbeat one after another after another that we have to be cognizant of that's why i follow dailyjobcuts.com as closely as i do so small businesses keep going one after one and then if you follow businesses with liabilities of 50 million or more and you follow that uh, through Bloomberg or the headlines or what have you, those type of Chapter 11 great big filings are running at the fastest pace since 2009. So we're definitely seeing uh, you know, the outgrowth of the ongoing credit crunch. It's just not one bank failing after another after another and the risk of contagion that's taking us, m- making us paranoid. But that doesn't mean that there's not a steady drumbeat of insolvencies going on in the background. Uh, we have to talk about delinquencies of, of people not being able to afford their existing debt. We talked about this last time you were on the show. You're expecting a rise in consumer uh, delinquencies. Now, if you look at something like credit card delinquencies, that's been rising, not yet at 2008 levels. But overall, would you make the assessment that consumer strength is still healthy right now? You know, it's interesting because if you listen to Ally Financial or Capital One, the the rate at which their delinquency levels, their charge off levels are rising over a three month period is just astonishing. So, I, and, and if you're if you're talking about the New York Fed and and its some of its consumer surveys, lenders uh, lenders look forward to their expectations in terms of rejections for mortgages, home equity lines of credit, auto loans, credit cards, you name it. They anticipate that in in the next six months that the rejection levels for consumer loans will take out the all-time highs from the great financial crisis. Of course, as you know, auto delinquencies are already well into record territory, and we're still sitting with, what, a 3.6% unemployment rate. So I think that we will indeed rewrite the book on consumer delinquencies, but time all is said and done. 
you have a very interesting chart, and I'm going to show this. On the left-hand panel, you've got basically the more wealthy households spending more, where there's an uptick in annual spending. And this is interesting. It's paired with something called business tax refunds. So tell us about this correlation. So it, it's fascinating. Um, you know, I, I speak to clients all of the time, small business owners. They're, they're being bombarded by solicitations uh, from companies that, that can help you apply for and receive your employee retention credit, your ERC. Uh, and it's an incredible cottage industry that's grown up. And it didn't, it didn't really happen immediately following the passage of the CARES Act. This industry really took off when the Biden administration extended this program that says that if your business was interrupted by the pandemic, anytime from the onset of the pandemic through the third quarter of 2021, that you were eligible to apply for a credit for up to $26,000 of payroll taxes per employee. And by the way, for both years, as long as you can demonstrate that your business was interrupted. The long story short is most of the companies that truly qualified for this credit have long since received the money. But in its place, we've had this, this cesspool of fraud. In fact, the IRS has been pleading with the community you know, please be cognizant of the fact that we will audit you. We will claw these monies back. It doesn't matter. The cat's out of the bag. It's the it's the worst kept secret in corporate America among fiscal authorities. This this employee retention credit we thought might be topping out last December when we saw twenty five point six billion dollars pumped into the U.S. economy. No, 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 that wasn't the case. We had a slight pullback in January and February, but since then it's been off to the races. Uh, this last June, just two months ago, uh, we saw we saw these refunds hit twenty nine billion dollars. The month of July that we've just come out of thirty three billion dollars. This is on a per month basis. So if you were to see a continuation of the July run rate of four hundred billion dollars pumped into the U.S. economy on a per annum basis, that would be worth about one and a half percentage points of GDP. And it goes a long way towards explaining the mystery on the sell side. Why is this baton handoff from goods from good services, from good spending to services spending been so strong? Well, it kind of helps that everybody and their dog is is making one of these claims and bilking Uncle Sam and US taxpayers and collecting billions upon billions of dollars. And by the way, they take it and spend it overseas. And that's another chart that I've shared with you that shows a literal lockstep relationship with international overseas spending on the part of Americans. Talk to anybody who's been to London, Paris recently. They say the Champs-Élysées is full of American shoppers. Well, guess what? They're spending taxpayer dollars and most of these claims are fraudulent. It's $240 billion, according to your chart uh, of the latest uh, uh, amount in tax refunds. Who exactly qualifies? Well, uh, you, you could be a startup company that came out of, uh, of the pandemic and, and, and qualify. In fact, the, in, in the beginning, most of the fraud that we, we had seen were for companies that were specifically established to take advantage of this credit. In theory, if you could demonstrate that your business was interrupted for five hot minutes, in the first three quarters of 2021, you can claim this benefit. If you've got 100 employees, it's 100 times $26,000. I've heard of six, seven-figure employee retention credits coming to people. Uh, once these government programs tend to be exploited, it's very hard to undo the damage. Yeah. Um, this broadly speaks to the bifurcation in sentiment between the wealthy and uh, the bottom tercel in income. I found this chart over the weekend as I was just doing some digging. Uh, this is from the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment. And what we see is that usually historically the wealthy and the and the, and the less wealthy, they, they tend to have similar sentiment levels at all times, you know, barring some exceptions. What we see in the latest data point is that the wealthy, the top tercel of income, their sentiment has soared. It's not nearly as high as pre-COVID levels, but it's just gone up in a straight line, whereas the bottom tercels continue to go down. Can you make the assessment, Danielle, that if the wealthy continues to prop up the economy, for whatever reason, business tax refunds, maybe their net worth is increasing, doesn't matter, then maybe we can avert a recession altogether because they keep spending money. Well, you know, it's altogether possible. Your average American family, 45 million or so that have been in receipt of food stamps, got a haircut of $200 uh, per month. 
So that really hurt that lower tercile that's reflected there in the University of Michigan. But my 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 greater sense, though, is that we're going to see an, a renewed increase in larger layoff announcements, starting with yellow trucking, but that fan out to the broader industrial complex. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Uh, and it, it, was, it was interesting, an economist made note that if the backlogs in the manufacturing surveys managed to stay in contraction, it's been 14 months in a row. And what, what you think of with a, back, a backlog is an unfilled order. Unfilled orders have been contracting for 14 months in a row if you look at regional Federal Reserve manufacturing surveys. And what that means is they have too many employees on hand. If they don't have backlogs, if they don't have demand that they see coming up, then they know that it's time to start cutting heads. And we know that we've seen a precursor to this because we've seen hours worked come down appreciably. In addition to that, if you look at the University of Michigan, that highest income tercile, their expectations for rising unemployment are much, much higher than that of the middle and the lower tercile. In other words, the people you call call boss, the small business open, that, that upper tercile, their expectations for a rising unemployment rate, we, we plotted this out over the weekend at QI Research, are much, much higher. They know what's coming. They know that they're going to be doing virtual pink slips or Zoom calls or however they do it these days. Is that because they're cost cutting? Uh, just... Is it out of necessity or is it, is it just some sort of corporate spring cleaning on their balance sheet here? I mean, well, what, listen, what's... If, if you talk, if, listen to some of these banks, listen to some of these these big uh, conglomerates. They're saying that consumer demand is coming down and coming down pretty hard. And if that's the case, then you know that you've got to cut costs, especially because the cost of carrying inventory is at the shortest end of the borrowings. So where the Fed funds rate, your overnight rate. That's how. That's the price you have to pay to carry inventory. A lot of companies also are starting to have to refinance some of their debts. That math just doesn't work in this kind of an environment when the Federal Reserve is higher for longer. One argument I've heard for why uh, the lower tercel income group is feeling a little bit you know, less optimistic than the wealthy is because of inflation. We had high inflation two years ago. Prices remain elevated relative to pre-COVID levels, although the level of inflation, which is the rate of change of prices, has been coming down. What's your outlook on, on inflation? So, no, um, with every reason, just because we're in a disinflationary environment, and in many areas, we are already starting to see deflation, i.e., used cars. That doesn't mean that everything that was in, in, that 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 suffered rising prices is not it, it nowhere near pre-COVID levels. I'll give you an example, a real life example. I sent my oldest son to the grocery store to get a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread. That gallon of milk was three ninety nine. I was pretty happy with that. The loaf of bread was four dollars and fifty nine cents. We're talking about sandwich bread here. Prior to COVID, that was always $2.99. So for your average working family, having to shoulder those higher costs, it doesn't matter that disinflationary impulses are at work right now in the economy. That's a very real thing. If you look at trueflation being at 2.25% with a 97% correlation to headline CPI, you know the slowing in the economy is going to manifest at lower inflation rates. But that doesn't mean flip to your average working family, especially if they were uh, if they were reliant on the food stamp program, which again, your average family lost $200 per month. Yeah, that's absolutely true. If you break down the CPI into its compartments, uh, or components rather, groceries have continued to go up, whereas things like discretionary items, airfares have gone down. So uh, if, yeah, you're, you're right. It, the things that the normal regular American would care about and spend the most money on, that's still going up. And so generally speaking then, do you think inflation is still going to remain uh, a force to be reckoned with for the average person into 2024? I think price pressures are going to continue to crimp household budgets. And we're seeing an increased percentage of especially younger student loan borrowers are actually starting to pay their student loans because they know that they're going to be that they're going to have interest accrued even before the October the 1st drop dead deadline. We're seeing an increase in student loan repayments start to pick back up. That's even going to be a bigger governor on growth. And by the way, 9.4% of your student loan payments are north of their $800 or higher. Think of all of the aspirational buyers in that middle income tier in the University of Michigan 
who moved out to the exurbs and and after COVID hit, bought a house for the first time. They're the ones with the thousand dollar car payment that Edmonds reports one fifth of of, of new car uh, purchases are uh, ha- have one thousand dollar payments or higher. They've also got the highest on a monthly basis student loan payment. Think of that aspirational buyer, that middle income tier that you're talking about. They're worth a good forty percent of consumption, whereas your lowest your lowest um, quartile. I'm, I'm 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 switching from tertiles to quartiles, but on purpose. Your lowest your lowest quartile is only responsible only accounts for less than ten percent of consumption in the United States. But once you get up to this area that are going to have appreciably large student loan payments, they account for forty percent of spending. So there's a storm brewing as we approach October the first. Uh, I'm curious as to how Jerome Powell is going to respond to all this. Assuming he knows what you know, what's he going to do next? Well, you know, if if the if the data weaken enough here in the short term, maybe he'll push pause again on September the twentieth. Uh, you know, if that's not the case, if if the payrolls data are strong, and we know the Bureau of Labor Statistics could not, could, they can't pull data out of the air to save themselves. Last week we got. We got some revisions to the second and third and fourth quarters of 2022. The birth death uh, announcement was taken down by 816,000 negative revisions to 2022 payrolls. Does anybody pay attention to that? No. My point is, David, could we see strong payrolls data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics? Yes, it's entirely feasible that, that the unemployment rate stays really low and that Jay Powell looks for an excuse to stay higher for longer because he wants to shrink that balance sheet. He has that in his sights. He wants to trim another trillion dollars off of the size of that balance sheet, and he's looking for any excuse that he can get in the data. I keep hearing from people that he doesn't want to be Arthur Burns. I mean, is, has that window passed? Assuming he does nothing anymore, is that is the is the risk of inflation running rampant out of control now uh, still even there. We just talked about inflation. I'm just I'm just curious at how monetary policy is going to affect inflation going forward. Look, I, I fully anticipate that all the inflationistas, it's QE. They all they're all in crypto. You know, the minute we see the July CPI report hit and oh my God, gasoline prices are in an eight month high and, and July of twenty two printed at zero point zero zero. So the headline CPI is gonna jump. Okay, fine. Let's let that happen. But we also know from apartmentlist.com that rents nationwide year over year are declining. And by the way, that input is much bigger than any of the other ones. We also know that food prices, even though they're high at an absolute level, we know that food inflation is coming down. Food inflation is twice the input weight of energy. Shelter inflation is four times the rate of healthcare inflation. So base effects or not, it's gonna be really hard to pull core, especially inflation up. And we know that that's exactly what Jay Powell at least reports to be following is that core. What's your view on the US dollar in relation to monetary policy? And uh, we know that other central banks have followed their own policies. The ECB, for example, last week raised their interest rates for the ninth consecutive time. Meanwhile, the Bank of Japan kept rates unchanged. So different banks are pursuing different policies. Where does the US dollar fit in in the global picture? Well, I still see the U.S. dollar as being, you know, the most attractive horse in the glue factory. At some point, it's going to be no more. But for here and now, if you look at at what happened as a factor of time with Germany's first quarter GDP announcement that was originally reported as being unchanged, subsequent revisions ended up pushing that into the negative. I suspect that the second quarter, there's a reason for this answer, I suspect that the second quarter German GDP print that also just came out as being unchanged, given sense indicators continuing to deteriorate, that that's, we're going to see a third consecutive quarter of a negative print once these revisions come out. The ECB is going to have a very difficult time if the juggernaut, the third largest exporting nation in the world, Germany, is in recession for three quarters running and France just printed negative year over year unexpectedly retail sales. So Christine Lagarde's going to have her hands full in terms of of her own hire for longer campaign, given that it's very much more obvious that, that Europe is sliding into recession on top of the fact that Chinese official data are signaling that the services sector is on the cusp of contracting. And if that's the official data, God help us, who knows what the unofficial data 
really means. So you're talking about Germany and China at a time when the United States is slowing appreciably outside of the highest income earners that are also being propped up by a wealth effect because the stock market is high. At some point, you're running out of pillars of support here. So you're saying short term, we can still see dollar strength. Is that what you're saying? I'm, medium term, we can still see dollar strength. Medium term. Okay. Excellent. I'm just curious. I mean, it's one thing to keep rates elevated. I'm just curious to how the Treasury is going to pay for the ballooning interest payments on this debt. It's nearing $1 trillion. Um, even if Jerome Powell doesn't raise rates again, even if he just keeps rates at the same level, we can assume that these payments uh, will still be very expensive. How is the government financing this? That's a really good question. Uh, and I think some of it goes back to you know, the fact that we're, I mean, some of it re is reflected in a budget deficit that's, that's 9% of GDP. I mean, for heaven's sake, $6.7 trillion of spending in the most recent fiscal year. That's barely, that's barely off of the $7.6 trillion in record fiscal spending for one year that we saw at the peak of the pandemic. So interest service expenses, interest service costs are going to be highly problematic going forward and we just had the treasury announce that it was going to be increasing its quarterly funding from 96 billion to 104 billion longer out longer out maturities things are going to get very difficult in washington and david i think you need to look further out on the time horizon because the more the government is allocating to servicing the cost of the nation's debts the less it's going to have leeway in real recession to pushing forward with fiscal spending programs. It's so much more of what is being spent is being spent just to service the debt. And we have to look out over that horizon given the way that fiscal spending was structured after the pandemic. So what does this all mean for asset allocation then? Asset allocation is extremely tricky. When you've got a handful of stocks that have been driving the train and you've got 6% alternatives in very short-term risk-free cash, it's really, to me at least, it's a no-brainer in terms of, of the choice to be made. So there are going to be pockets of strength here and there, places that are going to be recession-proof, so to speak. But in, in this kind of an environment, I think you have to be up in credit, way up in credit. And be, because again, you're in the middle of a bankruptcy cycle. You're in the middle of a default rate cycle. And you have to be cognizant of that. And if you're getting paid to be safe, and if your gold price is hanging in there, I, I think that it's just a lot easier to allocate your assets in this environment than people make it out to be. Maybe not if you're a mutual fund manager and you get penalized if you're not 150% in the stock market. I understand that. But if you're just Joe Q right now, you get paid a lot to sit on the sidelines. You know, I've noticed that the Russell 2000 has lagged behind the S&P 500, mainly because it doesn't include the biggest tech stocks that have surged. Would you position yourself in the small to mid caps, knowing that they've been relatively undervalued? I say relatively, although there is, like we discussed, a risk of higher delinquencies, higher bankruptcies, uh, potentially more layoffs uh, in the corporate sector. It's tricky, like you said. It is. And if you're looking for kind of some of the lowest rated entities, that's where they're going to live. But we also have to bear in mind, you know, a company, and I'm not making any specific comment about AT&T, but the largest investment grade rated company on planet Earth also came out, you know, just a few weeks ago and said, oops, we don't really have $3 billion of cash on hand. We only have a billion of cash on hand to service what are $145 billion of debt. So I think People should also be cognizant of how big that triple B segment is that lives just above that line of separation between investment grade and junk. Don't always assume that just because it's rated investment grade that it's safe. In fact, I think one of the cheapest things that you can buy out there is protection, the CDX index uh, for investment grade uh, bonds. Besides that, uh, what other recession proofs, one or two assets that you like that you think are recession proof? Recession proof. Well, um, you know, I, I think I think your staples in some ways are going to be there, but I wouldn't I wouldn't say staple in the sense that I've traveled two thousand two hundred and ninety three miles of the United States in the last 
12 days. So I've seen I've seen quite a, quite a bit of it on a few road trips. Um, there's a family dollar next to every family something else. Sorry, I, I just got the two wrong, and I, there are two in the small town I spend the summer in. Um, family family dollar and family something else. I apologize. Anyways, it it's just like it was back when there was a Staples across from an Office Depot or an Office Max. So even when you're talking about the reason I'm I'm being shady here is because you would think that a discount retailer would be the place to hide right now. Um, Walmart Walmart has done a very good job of, and I'm not making an individual stock recommendation because I can't, but but look to companies that have adapted really well. And if yellow trucking goes, you might see the freight recession finally end just by taking that much capacity out of the system, in addition to all the bankruptcies that we've already seen in the freight industry. So that might be something that is another, Walmart was looking for drivers just a few days ago. So that might be a pocket of strength simply because you're taking down a $5 billion player in that one market that has been plagued by overcapacity. Yeah, not a stock pick, but Walmart has beat every single recession except the first one uh, that it was uh, after it's IPO'd. But yeah, um, well, it good. Earned, uh, distribution centers at its stores as opposed to having to have a massive warehouse structure. So that, that's, there's something to be said for innovative thinking in terms of company management. Tell us a little bit about QI research uh, before we go and uh, your research process and some of the topics that perhaps your readers, uh, subscribers are curious to know about right now. So, you know, subjects such as business income tax refunds, the employee retention credit, trying to find drivers of the economy as opposed to saying it's a mystery, uh, looking for ways that you can profit by looking at where CDX indices are trading because in, in so many accounts, you can buy so many different things that are not stock specific. And that's what we try and do for our clients every day at QI Research. We publish 13 separate pieces every week. We've got a great retail product, dmartinobooth.substack.com. Our Daily Feather readers absolutely love what we publish and with good reason, but we've got a professional um, platform as well. I've got my own private Twitter feed that's attached to that and a dashboard that is dynamic and always has where our portfolio how our portfolio is, is allocated uh, um, in, in addition to all of our all, all of the research that's out there so th th that we produce. So we're very prolific and and very honest in our approach. We, we truly give new meaning to independent research. I worked on the sell side. I worked inside the Federal Reserve. I will never be chained and gaggled again by uh, agenda or, 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 any, or any kind of bias or for heaven's sakes, compliance. So um, love what I do and love all of our clients. Final question before we go. You you worked for the Fed, and we, we know you as a Fed insider. You've worked also on Wall Street, but I don't know if many people know this about you, but you've also attended Columbia Journalism School. And at one point, did you decide, okay, I'm not going to be a journalist. I'm going to work on the business side. How did that transition take place? Well, it actually went in the opposite direction. When I was on Wall Street, I decided that when I retired, I wanted to be a journalist. Oh, so, okay. So my first... I had an MBA in finance, which took me off to, to Wall Street. And I said, well, as soon as I leave Wall Street, which I did after 9-11 for many different reasons, and I signed a non-compete and agreed to leave the industry, I had just graduated from night school at Columbia while I was working full-time on Wall Street. So I thought I was retiring, and I had a daily column at the Dallas Morning News, and I was precluded from being in the finance industry. And then one day, Warren Buffett called and said, wow, you're writing some great stuff. So I he flew me out to Omaha, and that was a lot wow. of fun. I went, wow, I miss finance. And then a few months later, Richard Fisher from the Dallas Fed called and said, come serve your country. Uh, so I ended up being a really good writer with really good journalism skills, but back in the business world. So, Yeah, I think you talked about that background in your book, Fed Up. So everyone should check that book out and uh, follow Danielle's work. Link in the description down below. Thank you very much for spending the time with us today, Danielle. Looking forward to next time. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.